All right, Galatians chapter 3 is where we started. And what I'm going to be covering this afternoon is obviously we know salvation is by grace through faith. There's no disputing that. There's no arguing that. And people who even believe in works will, will give lip service to that as well. No one really wants to contradict salvation is by grace through faith. Unless you're in a cult like a, you know, Jehovah's False Witness or something like that. Then they'll say, no, 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 you, you absolutely have to have works and they don't mind just saying it out loud. But um, one of the problems in modern Christianity, I think even among many people who are believers, who truly are believers in Jesus Christ, is where does the law fit in to the life of someone who's a believer? Where is it? Uh, how is it that, that we should, you know, the Bible is very clear right here that it's not of the works of the law. It has nothing to do with the law. We're actually free from the law. And you'll hear people sometimes say, hey, man, I'm free in Christ. Now, that's great. We're free in Christ, right? What are we free from? We're free from the curse of the law. But one thing that we need to, to be careful about and watch out for is the people who think that basically the law just doesn't apply anymore at all because we're in the New Testament and because we're saved that basically you could just do whatever you want and... There's not a problem with that. Now, the Bible teaches very different than that, and we're going to see that. We're going to look at some of the verses today. We started off with Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3 is an awesome chapter, especially for preaching the gospel to someone. Galatians 2, Galatians 3, you could show people that are hung up on works, that it's not of works. But one of the places that people will, will turn to than to say that, oh, well, we, you know, we don't need to follow the law anymore is Galatians 3 could be a passage that they would use. But let's reread some of this. Let's go back up to verse number 16. The Bible says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not in the seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. So this is explaining that Abraham was given promises, but then the law didn't actually come until 430 years later. It came after that when Moses gave the law, which is, you know, the, um, the Leviticus, Deuteronomy, right? The, the law of God that was given through Moses. That came after, but he's, he's bringing up the point that, well, Abraham was given these promises before that even ever came. He's explaining that salvation is never through the law. It wasn't through the law. The law doesn't disannul the promise. God made the promise first, and then he instituted the law. So he's saying, like, just because you break the law doesn't make that promise of none effect. Just because now you broke a law, you're a sinner, you deserve his punishment, because there's this law in place, he's saying that, that, doesn't, that doesn't nullify the promise that was made. And this is the whole point. So we, we need to understand what is, what is really being taught, what is being expressed in the passage. Get the whole thing in context instead of just yanking out maybe one verse to try to prop up some whole doctrine on, because they'll prop up a verse that says, you know, we're no longer under the law. And it's like, well, yeah, but what is the context of it talking about? If we, Because what they'll try to do is say, well, we're no longer under the law, which means you can't judge me on anything that I do because we're not under the law. We're free in Christ. But that's not the purpose of what these verses are saying. You know, in a sense, it's saying, yeah, you're free from the curse of the law, but it's not saying that you just go ahead and do whatever you want and there's no problem and there's no judgment. Now, there's, there may not be an eternal judgment of, of spending you know, eternity in hell, but there's still a problem with saying that, you know, no, you, know, you could just do whatever you want and God's fine. And actually, that type of an attitude gives once saved, always saved, what we believe, a bad name when people just just teach and say, oh, you can just do whatever you want. I was just talking to a Pentecostal lady like a week ago that, you know, because this is how it's presented to them, right? They're going to their church and they'll say, oh, this is, you can't believe one saved, always saved because they just think that you could just live however you want and everything's just fine. And, you know, you could just keep on sitting and doing this stuff. And, and, it's, and it's a mixed bag when they, when they preach this stuff, because on one hand, well, yeah, you know what? You will still be saved no matter how you live. 
But on the other hand, it's also not what God is telling you to do to just live in sin and just who cares and be flipping about it and say whatever. So we're going to see a lot of verses that tell us, you know, should we continue in sin? God forbid. Of course we shouldn't continue in sin. Of course we should live a righteous life. And of course there's consequences for our actions. No, the law is still very much important in the New Testament, just as much as it was in the Old Testament. The law is there. Yea, we establish the law. And that's what the title of the sermon is this morning. Yea, we establish the law. Let's keep reading here because he's explaining now this, this concept of Abraham receiving promises. The law came after that. Verse number 18, For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So he's saying, if you're going to receive an inheritance because you're obeying God's law, because you're being a righteous person and just obeying everything that God said, then it's no more promise. You're earning it. You're working for it. You're doing it. It has nothing to do with just receiving a promise that God made to you. He says, but God did give it to Abraham by promise. It wasn't through his obedience, through his keeping the law. Wherefore then serve the Lord? He said, well, then why do we even have the law? What's it there for? If we have the promise already, then why do we even have the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. It is the law then against the promises of God. God forbid if there had been a a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. So what is all this saying? It's saying that why, why do we have the law? Because people are sinners, because of transgressions already. He says he needs to spell it out for us. That you're not as good as you think you are. So he has it listed out and just spelled out in a law, just in writing saying, there it is. You're not as righteous as you think you are. You have broken, you've transgressed this law and he spells it out for us. And he says that, well, is that then contrary or against the promises? No, it's not against the promises. He says, but if there had been a law given that could have given life, if you could have been saved by the law, then righteousness should have been by the law. Then he said he would have just done it that way. But it's impossible. That's why you need the promise in, because of the law. Verse number 22, But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. So before any of us had faith, before you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you were bound under the curse of the law. That's all you had. You didn't have the promise. You didn't have that yet because you didn't put your faith in Jesus Christ. You were just kept under that law. And that's all you had. And under the law, all you're going to get is a curse because you've broken it and you deserve the punishment. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. So it's saying here, it's basically a teacher. The law is there to teach you to say, hey, you're a sinner. You need Christ. And isn't that exactly what we do when we go out and preach the gospel? It's the first thing you show people for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You're a sinner. You don't deserve to go to heaven. You can't earn it. There is no law that was given that's going to give you eternal life. You've actually contrarily broken God's law, which is why you need a Savior. So that law is given. We go over, you've, sin, you've lied, you've stolen, you've done whatever, something to break God's law. You're in trouble. You need a Savior. That law pushes people to the Savior. That alone is extremely important. But there's more to it than just that. The Bible says, then, but after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So see, people want to just take that verse and just run with it and see, see, faith has come. We're no longer under a schoolmaster. The law doesn't apply. We don't need the law for anything anymore. We're done. We're good. But that's not what it's saying. It's saying that, yeah, you're, you're free from the curse of the law. But it's not saying that the law is just void and meaningless after you get saved. And we'll prove that to you. Turn, if you would, to um, Romans chapter 3. We're going to spend some time in Romans. Romans is one of the best books to kind of to prove this point.
But just to illustrate, there's another verse I'm going to read for you from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. That the law is still in place for believers in the New Testament. We're going to go over many verses that will say this, but there's one example in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 20, where the Apostle Paul is talking about getting people saved. He says, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. So he's, what he's trying to do is he, he ends up finishing and saying, I become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. So he's, he's trying to get to their level and, and communicate with them and be like them. So they say, oh, you're under the law? Well, here, I know the law. Let's, you know, and communicate with them and still give them the gospel from a, from a level that they're going to be able to understand. To the Jews I became as a Jew. To them that are under law, I came as under law. But then in verse 21, he says, to them that are without law. People are saying, there is, I don't need to follow any law. Well, to them, he's going to come to them as without law, he says. He says, but being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. So he's only going to go so far when he's trying to be like people to try to get them to, to bring them to Christ. There's a limit. He said, I'm not going to go so far just without law to be like these people because I'm going to keep myself still under the law of Christ. I'll approach them like you know, they, they live or they understand of just being without law, but I'm still going to maintain being under the law of Christ. So he's not going to go to the people that just think that you can live this hedonistic lifestyle and just do whatever you want and there is no law for them and join in in their unlawful activities in order to get them saved. He's not going to go get drunk at the bar with these guys that think, hey, there's no law. What do I care? It's no big deal. In order to try to get the, give them the gospel. No, I'm still going to stay under the law to Christ. I'm still going to keep myself under that law. Now, if there were no law as a New Testament believer to keep under, then why would that, how would that verse even make sense? Of the Apostle Paul saying, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. It wouldn't even make sense if there was no reason. You know, why, why would he? Well, no, he is, he is keeping under the law to Christ because we are supposed to as New Testament believers. Romans chapter 3. And you could literally read the whole chapter. Obviously, it's an awesome chapter. We're not going to take the time to do that this morning. I originally planned on doing that, but we're going to hit some of the highlights in Romans chapter 3. So let's look at verse number 7 to start. The Bible says, For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner, and not rather, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. And this is the accusation that people have been giving to people like the Apostle Paul, or like us that believe that once a person is saved, you're saved forever and that no amount of sin that you do is going to keep you out of heaven once you've already accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, that, that you are saved. But people will take that and twist that and turn that into saying, well, let's do evil so that we could have more grace, right? Let's just keep sinning because it's already paid for. Let's just keep on doing it and doing it and doing it. And this is the attitude that people, by and large, are the reason why they don't want to accept once saved, always saved as a doctrine, because they just have this mindset of just like, well, this is what you're going to do, and this is what you're like. I get it all the time, people saying that, oh, well, that can't be true, because then you can just, you know, you just do whatever you want, people don't even care. And they always say, well, I know this person that says that they got saved, and they're doing this, and they're doing this, and they're doing that, and they say... Who cares? Because I'm saved already. You know, so they always have these examples of people who are living the way that they're trying to ascribe then to everybody that believes that way. And this is why he says, we were slanderously reported as saying this. You know, they, they didn't actually say it, and it's actually bringing a bad name on what they believe, because that's not what they believe. That's not what they're teaching. They're not just saying, hey, let's just do evil. Let's just go off and sin, because grace is going to abound, because we'll just have that much more grace. He's saying that's ridiculous. Let's jump down to verse number 19. The Bible says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and that 
all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, this is a very interesting passage. I love this passage. It says that, um, of course, that, that the law shows us, and, it's, and it convicts the entire world because everybody's a sinner. We're all guilty. And by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Nobody is, is good in the eyes of God just by keeping the law because nobody can keep the law. But then it says that the righteousness of God without the law, so being made righteous, being saved without the law, by not obeying the law, it says it was manifested being witnessed by the law. So the very law that condemns us witnesses and gives a witness to the fact that your actual salvation comes outside of the law. That it's, that it's not by the law. The law itself witnesses that you need to be saved by grace through faith. That you need to be forgiven. That you need to have a Savior. The law tells us that. Jump down to verse number 28. The Bible says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So anyone that wants to try to mix in faith plus works, very good verse. Highlight that verse if you don't have it memorized already. We conclude, the conclusion is that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of law. You do not need the works. It's not faith plus works. We're justified by faith without the deeds of the law, without obeying the commandments, without the law. That is how we're saved. And then uh, jump down to verse number 31. It says, do we then make void the law through faith? Because that's what a lot of people tell you, that the law is void. The law is done away with. We don't need a law anymore. It's, all, it's, it's meaningless for the New Testament believer. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. No, we're setting up the law. Not to be saved by the law, but we are establishing God's law because the law itself bears witness that we need a Savior. Flip over, if you would, to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter number 5. Verse number 12, the Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. So the whole, again, the purpose of the law is just to show us, hey, sin is still in the world. People are still sinners, whether or not it's explicitly just, just spelled out that you've done wrong. But the law is given so that sin can be imputed when there is no law. You, you know, that's how you're held responsible is through the law. Jump down to verse number 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. The offense, the sin, what you're doing. See, when the law is given, now the offense abounds. It, it increases in number because now there's a law given so that people can, can look to and be like, oh, okay, yeah, I broke this law. When, when there is no law, then the offense doesn't abound because there's no law to say, hey, this is, this is wrong. But um, it says, more of the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So no matter how much sin there is, no matter how many laws have been added, no matter what is considered to be a sin, grace covers all of that sin. It just, it just abounds even further over. So sin can multiply and grow, and then grace grows even further around all of that sin. Verse 21 says that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So this is what's being taught at the end of Romans chapter 5, is that, hey, even no matter how much sin increases, no matter how much a person sins, grace can cover all of that. But then the key question comes in chapter 6, verse number 1, the very next verse. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Hey, grace is a good thing. Let's have more grace, right? So we might as well just continue sinning because then we'll just have more and more and more grace. Let's increase grace, right? 
No. And that's what Paul is being slanderously reported of. And that's what we are slanderously reported of when we go out and teach people that it's not of works. You put your faith in Christ and you're saved and sealed eternally. And yes, even if you do sin, you have a mediator. Even if you sin, no matter how much you sin, you still have eternal life. Well, should we just continue in sin? God forbid. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Of course we shouldn't. So keep in mind when you're explaining salvation to someone and you're trying to persuade them about the truth of the gospel and the truth about eternal life and that it's not of works and you show them all these examples, but they're hung up on the fact that, well, how can you live? don't forget to leave out the judgment of God for believers. Because you, you, need, you need to balance out God's grace with still the law being important, the law having an effect, the law still meaning something, that God's not going to hold you guiltless just because you are saved. That there are consequences for our actions, that you don't just get away with everything. And that the more, one, the more you sin... It's, it's as if, I know Jesus already died on the cross, but it's like you're just continuing to add up and just pile on that sin onto the shoulders of Jesus Christ as he was hanging on that cross. Every sin that we commit, it's just, just throw that on him. That's one, one way to, to, to keep your, your mind right and to help you do right is just, just remember that. The next time you find yourself, you know, sinning, especially willfully sinning, just think, I'm just putting more of that on Jesus Christ's shoulders. But not only that, we need to understand, and people need to understand that God's not going to hold you guiltless in the sense that you're still going to receive chastisement, you're still going to punish you. You're still going to reap what you sow. You're still going to, going to receive for what you've done in the body here, in the flesh. Yes, you're still a child of God, but he's a loving father and he's going to discipline his children. So we need to make sure that people understand that too because it's, not the, it's a very important concept that can that could lead people astray and cause them not to believe the truth just because they think that, like Romans 6, 1 says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound because they just think that that's what you're talking about. And no. Even though the truth is still there about being saved. And I've had people, you know, I've convinced them and then they're just like, yeah, but you still shouldn't tell people that. I'm like, but it's the truth. So I am going to tell people that. Well, they might think that they could just go off and say, well, you know what? That's between them and God because you know what? If they do sin, they still are saved. So I am going to tell people that that's the truth because that is the truth. I'm not going to withhold that from them because I'm worried that they might go off and sin. Well, guess what? You're going to go off and sin. I'm going to go off and sin because we're all still sinners. Don't tell me you're perfect. I like having the assurance that I'm saved because it's not based off of my works. And that even when I do slip and stumble and fall and get into sin, I know I'm still saved. So yeah, I am going to teach the truth on that. Let's keep reading in Romans chapter 6, verse number 3. The Bible says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So this is what the Bible teaches. We should walk in newness of life. Verse number 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth... We should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he dieth, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is our mindset that we need to have, that we're dead unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. This is how we ought to live. Don't let sin reign in your body. Now, if there was no law for the new believer, 
for the Christian, then how could you even have sin? We've already read the verses in Galatians 3 and in Romans 3. It's talking about the law being a schoolmaster and the law showing us the law making sin what it is. That's, that's the definition of sin. For sin is the transgression of the law. You can't even have sin unless you have the law. So how can you say that there's no law anymore if the Bible is teaching someone who's already saved not to let sin reign in your body? Not to do it. That you have to avoid it. Then the way that we're going to not let sin reign is by obeying the law. The same way that... that the same reason that if someone, you know, telling someone that they have to repent of their sins in order to be saved is teaching them that they have to obey the law to be saved. Because when you repent of your sin, you're obeying the law. They'll say, no, 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 turn from sin to the Savior. No, no, what you're doing if you're turning from sin is you're turning to the law. Because you're, you're, you're going to stop sinning if you're repenting of your sins. And the way you stop sinning is by obeying God's law. But this is something we should do. This is how we should live. This is what we're called to do once you're saved is obeying God's law and not letting that sin reign in your mortal body. Verse number um, 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. And again, that's one of those verses. When you see, when you read it in context, you get exactly what the Bible's teaching. But if you just want to pull out one verse that says, well, you're not under the law, you're under grace. That's where the people run with it and say, see, we're not under the law, so I could just do whatever, and it's not, it's not a big deal. Because I'm under grace. Well, no, he just got done saying, don't let sin reign in your mortal body and, you know, and, and obey Christ and obey God and his commandments. And then, you know, that's not how you're saved, but you need to do that because, um, because you're saved. Because Jesus Christ died on the cross, because he rose again from the dead, that in the likeness of his resurrection, you ought to live a life um, like Christ. So, verse number 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants obey... His servants, ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Flip over, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, I mean, New Testament, well, you can't get much better than just out of the mouth of Jesus Christ himself, right? And he himself states that he did not come to destroy the law. He didn't come to nullify the law and just make it meaningless and void and empty. He came to establish the law, and that's what we need to be doing is establishing the law. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass. Now, have heaven and earth passed yet? I just, I mean, I woke up this morning. I, I thought I still saw the heaven and the earth, right? We're, we still have it? Okay. Because Jesus said, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now, has everything been, been fulfilled yet? Did Jesus Christ come back and I didn't realize it and he's already set up his kingdom and we've already gone through a thousand years and it's already everything's been fulfilled? Has all prophecy been fulfilled yet? No. Oh, wait. Okay, yeah. Well, then I guess then one jot or one tittle has not passed from the law either. Verse 19, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so. So saying, yeah, we're under grace. No big deal. Who cares? Sure, go ahead, drink it up. Whatever, whatever the, whatever the sin is. That is a real common one. 
and start teaching people, yep, yeah, we're under grace, no big deal. He shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But notice it, it doesn't say, well, he's not going, he's not going to heaven then. Because he's teaching bad doctrine. He's teaching false things. He's teaching people to sin. Does it say, well, they're not going to heaven? No, it says, well, he's just going to be called least. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So do you want to be Mr. Least in the kingdom of heaven? Then go ahead and just get into sin and you'll still be saved. Tell everyone else, no big deal. Stop judging me. You know, that's the law. That's so Old Testament. You know, I'm just free in the, from the law in the New Testament. So don't tell me how to live my life. I don't need to worry about the law. Mr. Least, say, say hello to Mr. Least in the kingdom of heaven. But if you want to be great, if you want to have a great place, a lot of rewards, a great place in the kingdom of heaven, then you know what you're going to do? You're going to do and teach and say, no, no, no. Let's follow God's law. Let's avoid sin. Let's do what's right to the best of our ability. Let's, let's study. Let's look at the word of God. Let's, let's meditate on it and let's keep God's law and teach other people the same thing. No, this isn't just outdated. This isn't just Old Testament. We should be looking to God's law and keeping God's law, and that'll make you great in the kingdom of heaven. Either, both people are going to be going because salvation is by grace through faith. But one's going to be least and one's going to be greatest. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs 28 because this, this is what really brings me now to the whole point of why I wanted to preach this sermon to begin with. Because I know many of you, probably all of you, are thinking, Pastor Burzens, I already know all this stuff. <laughs> this is milk. I get it. You know, we're very familiar with the law. We're very familiar with, with um, that we're saved by grace. But I was reading in Proverbs 28, th th this has to be established. You have to lay the groundwork for, for people to get this. And, and show and demonstrate from Scripture, first and foremost, no, the law is important. Jesus Christ himself said he didn't come to destroy the law. That's not the point. So when you read these verses that say we're free from the law, that Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. He came to save us from the law. But Proverbs 28, look at verse number 4. The Bible says, They that forsake the law praise the wicked, but such as keep the law contend with them. And I'm sick of the stinking snowflake society that we have, even among believers. People are going to claim the name of Christ. They get offended when a man of God will stand up and contend with the wicked and call them out and say they're wicked as hell and they're destroying America, they're destroying the churches, and they're going to come up and say, you know, these sodomites and these fags and whoever it is, they're destroying the world. They're, just, they're, they're enemies to Christ and we should not be inviting them in. We should not be, you know, bringing them into our churches and, and exposing our children to this, that we need to have standards, that we need to follow God's law, and they're going to look at someone like that and they're going to get, you know, they're going to promote the wicked person. They're going to love the person that hates God and bring down the man of God that's trying to preach against them and contend with them. And the book of Proverbs says, they that forsake the law praise the wicked. And it, the reason why there's so many people that are so tolerant these days, it's not just the brainwashing. The brainwashing has affected not just their thoughts, but their actions too. Because they've all gotten to this soft point of not really keeping the law. They don't really care about God's law. They don't love God's law because they're guilty. The more you're guilty of, the less you're going to be able to say anything about anybody else. The more wicked of a life you're living, how could you say anything to someone else? Look, I know this firsthand. I was saved at the age of 20 years old. But for many years of my life, I was living a wicked life. I knew that I was saved, but it got to the point to where I didn't even want to say anything about what anyone else was doing. Because I'd be a hypocrite then. I, I, how am I going to say something to you? Oh, you shouldn't be doing that. Don't you know the Bible says that, you know, and here I am being a drunk and a fornicator and whatever, you know, like just, just, you can't say anything like that. So what are you going to do? Naturally, because you're walking in the flesh, you're going to say, well, it's not that big of a deal. 
what someone else is doing. Why? Because you're guilty of all your own sins. If you're wondering why a Baptist preacher can't call out sin and call out extreme wicked, I mean, extreme wickedness. I mean, people that hate God, like really vile people, if they can't sound the trumpet against these people, then you wonder what's going on in their life. When you become so tolerant of the, of the worst forms of perversion that you can't stand up against it or stand at least with the other person who's standing against it, but you'd rather side with the world and side with the wicked, what's going on in that person's life? They that forsake the law, they praise the wicked. People praising these, these stars, whether they're movie stars or rock stars or sports stars or anybody who's put out there that's a wicked person. When you find someone praising those people, just remember they've forsaken God's law. They don't care as much about God's law as they do about promoting some wicked person. They that forsake the law praise the wicked, but such as keep the law contend with them. So you know what our job is? Our job is to contend. Contend means you're fighting. We're not just going to be passive about it. We're not just going to let it go. I'm going to say something about it. I'm going to call it out as being wicked. I don't care if it makes me lose friends. I don't care if people say, oh, you shouldn't say that. You might hurt somebody's feelings. You might offend somebody. I love God's law. So I'm going to contend with the wicked. I'm not just going to give you a free pass and let it go. No. I've had enough. Verse number five, evil men understand not judgment, but they that seek the Lord understand all things. Better is the poor that walketh in his uprightness than he that is perverse in his ways, though he be rich. Verse number seven, look at this. Whoso keepeth the law is a wise son. You are wise, you are be smart. Keep God's law. But he that is a companion of riotous men shameth his father. He that by usury and unjust in gain increaseth the substance, he shall gather it for him that will pity the poor. Look at verse number nine. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. Do your own word study on abomination and look how God applies that word and what he applies it to. Things that are abominable and abomination. The word literally means like, like really strongly hated. If something is abominable, it's even a stronger word than just using the word hate. Like abhor. Like, I don't just hate that, I abhor it. That is abominable in my sight. I never want anything like that in front of me ever. When you, when, especially when the people of God are turning away their ear from hearing the law, I don't want to hear that. Why are you preaching out of the Old Testament? Why are you preaching God's law? Your prayer becomes an abomination. God, God says, I don't want to hear from you. I don't want to hear what you're asking me of when you don't want to listen to my law. When you're not listening to me, why should I listen to you? That's what he's saying. He's saying this is, get, pff, you're going to come to me with prayer when, when you just you don't want to hear it? And it happens so often, too. People don't, they don't want to hear the Bible. That's why, you know, it's an abomination to me when the people just that, that want to come asking money from the church. They're just going to come and ask you, you know, they live, they're drunk. They're living in fornication. They're having children. They're doing all this stuff, right? And now they're being judged because of it. So now they've fallen on hard times and they go, oh, well, we want to have some money. Give me some money. You're a church. You're supposed to help the poor, right? I said, why don't you come to church? Why don't you come in a service? Because I could actually help you out more than just giving you some money. And then they don't want it. They don't, no, no, what? Pff, oh, you're not going to give me the money then? Yeah, get out of here. I don't want to hear your, your prayers, your requests on, on asking for money if you don't want to hear, you're going to turn your ear from hearing God's law. Because you could actually be helped to not be in that situation anymore. You get right with God. But you don't want to hear it, then stop asking me for things. And that's God's attitude. 
Those are some strong words to remember. And, and you know, you Christian out there that wants to turn your ears, well, I don't want to listen to God's law. I don't like that. I think that's kind of mean. I think you might offend some sodomite somewhere because you're saying that they should be put to death. Just remember, when you go to God in prayer, that God hates that prayer. That's abomination. So you're turning your ear from the law. Verse number 10, Whoso causeth the righteous to go astray in an evil way, he shall fall himself in his own pit, but the upright shall have good things in possession. The Bible says in Psalm 119.97, Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. We ought to love God's law. Psalm 19, verse 7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Yes, as believers, we do look to God's law. We ought to be following God's law. We ought to be exalting God's law. And we should be establishing God's law. The law is not made void. And let's not be like the hypocrite. We do believe the Bible. Yes, we believe salvation is by grace through faith, but yes, we believe all of God's word too. And we love God's law. And if you want to be wise, you're going to listen to God's law. And if we're going to do the most help to convince other people, then we need to be living as close as we can to the way the Bible says that we ought to be living. Because that's going to give you the most influence and the most power when people can see, hey, this person isn't just saying one thing and doing another. They're not just picking and choosing the parts they like from the Bible because no one wants to listen to someone who just is not consistent in what they believe. And you just pick this part. Oh, yeah, I like this, but I don't really like that. Why should anyone listen to you? You're just coming up with your own religion, your own stuff. But when you actually live the life and believe all of it, and will stand by it, that actually has some power to it. People will see that. And when you're walking according to God's word, you're going to be walking in the Spirit. And the Spirit's going to give you the power. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the law that you've given to us to, to teach us right from wrong, to show us the right way. Lord, help us to walk that right path on a daily basis. Help us to mortify the deeds of our flesh and to walk in the Spirit on a daily basis. God, help us to, to strive to, to be as good as we possibly can. Lord, we thank you tremendously for giving us the free gift of salvation, that the law does not save us, but that you paid the ultimate sacrifice in order for us to be saved. We thank you so much for that and our gratitude our graciousness for your grace is that we will be ever trying and striving to be good to, to listen to you to follow your commandments dear God and that way we know that when we go to you with prayer it won't come up as an abomination before you it's in Jesus name we pray amen